So this is hands down, without question, the worst camera I've ever shot. And yet I'm very obsessed with it and I take it with me everywhere. And it is the Sigma DP1S. we will get some of the basics out of the way. This is a five megapixel camera with a Foveon sensor, APS-C sized from 2009. It has your basic modes, manual shutter aperture and program mode, as well as there is a video mode on here and a voice record mode. It has a manual focusing wheel, which we will come back to. It has what appears to be a zoom toggle, but it is not. That is only in playback review. This is a fixed focal length equivalent of 28 millimeters with an F2.8, uh, I'm sorry, no, an F4 lens. It's pretty basic. It does have a pop-up flash, and I have the Sigma VF11 viewfinder on top because there is no optical viewfinder on the body itself. This is an accessory that I added after the fact. This was the first generation of Foveon sensor. The whole theory with Foveon sensors, and if you haven't um, watched any of my other Sigma reviews, I might recommend going back to, to watch some of the Foveon related content, but it's a layered sensor. So a red, green, and blue layer, each layer having five megapixels in theory, giving you a 15 megapixel file. So here is where this camera shines. This camera is absolutely amazing for having with you when you go out and about, uh, landscape still life, uh, daylit situations, really, really fantastic for that. Or even cloudy, like greenery. There is unquestionably something about the Foveon sensor that just makes it so highly unique and rich. I just, I, I'm hooked on these things. And I thought going back to this original generation was going to be very hard. And it was, and I'm not going to blanket recommend this camera at all, but stick with me. If you work with it and you dial it, it has some of the most satisfying files that you can get out of this price point. This is going to be the cheapest entry level camera for the Foveon Censored Sigmas. This is kind of a gateway drug because it um, can produce incredible, incredible files. I mean, I just love the way it renders certain scenes that I don't even expect to pull up on my computer, like this shot of this woman walking down the street in Prague. I did not expect it to look like this, and it just there is something so rich and wonderful that only this camera could produce. However, it is a difficult, finicky, and annoying camera. <laughs> um, so some of the annoyances are um, that you really have to dial every, everything in to make it really work for you. But on the upside, dialing it in with this camera is actually pretty easy. So what I have found works best for me is to set this on either sh uh, aperture or program mode. Those are the modes I'll often use if I'm in a slow, languorous setting and can take my time with the focus because the autofocus on this is slow, like everything else on this camera. Um, so I will do that or if I'm on the street snapping away, shooting from the hip, or I just wanna be faster and more responsive with my time, even with personal photos, I will move to manual exposure mode, set it at ISO 400. I know, sounds blasphemous, but bear with me. 
F8, set my manual focus on this wheel to 1.5 meters and fire away. And then it almost operates like a Ricoh GR where it's like snap focus. It's much faster. Is it still the fastest? No. There is still a shutter lag um, on this that drives me bunkers, but it's not so, so bad and you do get used to it. You just start to have to anticipate things a little bit more. The Ricoh GR is brilliant because it really is, it responds just as you press down the shutter. This one has a bit of shutter lag. And going back to that ISO 400, I have always on this channel espoused using base ISO on all these old cameras. I couldn't believe that I pushed this to ISO 400, but I found it just worked great. And the, um, the compromise or the sacrifice that you make by pushing this to ISO 400 in daylight at least was not substantial. It actually did not bother me. It, there, there might be some color noise, there might be some grain, but for the character of a camera like this, it is so worth it to me. And so that's kind of been my way of setting it. I forgot to mention, always set this to white balance of daylight. Even in a cloudy circumstance, I found that daylight, the little sun, um, white balance setting was my best way of getting a consistent result. The white balance on this is pretty terrible. And if I need to, I can adjust the white balance in post, but it gives me a good working file. I tried shooting this a bunch of different ways. I shot it in RAW, which is an X3F format. I shot it in JPEG. It works both ways, but ultimately what I ended up doing was favoring the X3F file and over the course of these weeks that I have been shooting this, I have moved farther and farther away from processing the images to just dialing everything in in camera, pulling the, the X3F files into Lightroom and exporting it directly from there. No post-processing whatsoever. And at first it took me a minute. I thought the files were overly yellow and green and this definitely runs yellow and green but i really came around to enjoy it and now i just barely correct anything at all if anything at all so i missed some points when i originally recorded this and so i wanted to pop back in with a few additional annotations i'll come in there when i'm done okay um one of the advantages of this camera is that the original dp series X3F files, which are the native file format for their RAWs, are read natively in Lightroom. This is not true for the Merrill series that came after or the Quattro series that came after that. It makes a much simpler workflow, a more fast and efficient workflow. And 90% of the time, I don't feel the need to go outside of Lightroom. However, if I'm in a high dynamic range situation, I will go to Sigma Photo Pro. It does a brilliant job of recovering highlight and shadow. I would say specifically highlight much more so than Lightroom. When there's any sort of clipping, Lightroom just can't do anything with it. Whereas you go into Sigma Photo Pro, and as you see in this example, the difference is dramatic. I highly recommend going into Sigma Photo Pro in high dynamic range situations. The F4 lens is definitely limiting. It makes it much harder to shoot indoors. There's no image stabilization on this. Um, there is obviously the limited ISO range. And frankly, for some reason, the Foveon sensor, at least of this generation, but I've also seen it with later generations, it just doesn't play well with artificial light. So like, I pretty much never use this indoors. This is really an outdoor camera, so it's never going to be my main shooter, but I, I love it because it's small enough, even in the generations that followed the Merrill, certainly the DP Quattro lineup, this is still the smallest, most compact form factor they ever created. And while I, while I say that about it being uh, not ideal for an indoor camera, and while I believe that, there is the pop-up flash, which is actually really effective. They have the DP2, which is a 50 millimeter equivalent, and the DP3, which I believe is a 75 millimeter equivalent. They never made a zero model of the original DP series, as far as I'm aware, which would have been the wide, sort of ultra wide angle lens. But the 28 for me is just, this is the perfect outdoor travel camera. I had it with me in Prague. I used it a lot and I was so delighted that this was the camera that was in my bag. I really think I will be traveling with this a lot more. Um, 
I never really expected to like it, frankly, as much as I did. The dynamic range of this camera is not great. Um, it's very limited. It's very much like shooting slide film. Again, why you just want to dial it in correctly in the camera itself so that you're getting exactly what you need in the histogram. What is nice is there is a direct control button here for exposure compensation. There is no live histogram when you're shooting, but there is a playback histogram, which is really handy, I think. Um, so when I'm in playback mode, I get just this little informative diagram on the side here showing my, me my histogram. And the way I get to that is um, if you toggle, I can't actually remember where the toggle is. It's just in the display mode. So this is a display button. It will turn it on or off. Um, and in play, it will, uh, you know, never turn it off. But when you're shooting, and for example, when I'm using my standard street settings of ISO 400, F8, 1 to 1.5 meters on manual focus, I will turn this screen off entirely and use this absolutely delightful viewfinder. This Sigma VF11 transforms this camera for me because it's very clear. You have a really nice, very clean frame line, one box, and you get your frame and it's pretty darn accurate. So I was just walking down the street shooting like that and for me, that made this camera just like my perfect travel pocket companion. There are no user settings, so you can't unfortunately save a bunch of like settings into a, a wheel turn. I do wish they had that. That would have been really nice, but it's not too bad. I go from manual and when I'm in manual, I have it set up the way I like it. Then I move over to program. It won't remember the settings in program, or I'm sorry, if I go back to manual, it won't remember it, but that's fine. It's like, you just, you just know you have to set it up before you're gonna start shooting it in any given mode. One thing I will say though, is this is like a two inch screen here. It is just God awful. It is so bad. Um, look at the histogram, but don't judge your images based on the, on the screen itself. It just crushes everything, the blacks, the highlights. It just looks crazy pants. And I remember when I was starting to shoot this, I just felt really uncertain whether I captured anything usable because of how illegible the screen was in terms of really rendering the image in a way that reflected the environment. The color is also really off. So like it looks super, super yellow or green here. And then when I pull it into Lightroom, it's like a mellower version of that that I can live with. If I was using what I saw on the screen, I'd be like crushed. It would not, it would not work for me. There are JPEG modes for black and white in here. There's like sepia, black and white, and color. Um, and the JPEGs are actually pretty great. Uh, again, you want to dial everything in ahead of time. Uh, so getting your white balance set, getting your proper exposure set, the JPEGs are highly usable. Focus starts at 0.3 meters in this uh, focus toggle here on the back. And I can't verify this for sure, but when I actually manually focus here, um, uh, sorry, when I auto focus here and I'm going to, I gotta put my screen back on, and I'm going to actually focus on something, the nearest distance that I seem to be able to get out of this is like, at minimum a foot. It is not a close focusing camera, but if you flip it into manual, you can get seemingly closer than one meter, which is what I feel like the autofocus is locking off at. It's not really allowing me to get closer than that. Also, if you are not comfortable with your focus distances, this is a good way to learn because you are not gonna be able to preview the focus distance when you are in manual focus. So now I'm in manual focus MF. You will get a little readout here at the bottom to show you your focus scale. And you can toggle your, or sorry, just spin your wheel to get to that focus range, but you're not really seeing it in preview. So it's not like, it, you, an F4 lens though is not super fast and it's an APS-C side sensor. So you're probably fine but when you actually pull a file in, and if you are not at a greater depth of field of like an F8, and you're off on your focus with a close subject, you will see it. On the back, uh, you will see how many images you have left on your card. This does take SD cards, which is wonderful. It has this, um, you know, lithium ion battery. It's a, uh, what is it? 
an SLB1237. I got these off of Amazon. This is a Castar like third party, works great. And the battery life is pretty terrible. Um, I carry three batteries with me all the time. But if you go on forums, it talks about just how god awful it is. And I actually got really far on three batteries. Like I did pretty well. I'd say I could capture like a pretty consistent pace of shooting a half day on like one battery. Not great, I know. But like it, it was better than I was expecting based on everything I'd read online. I will say again, just like use cases for this, travel, uh, still life, landscape, again, really great with the greens and just beautiful reds right out of camera. Just really just nails color in a way that is so totally Sigma. Not so great maybe portraits, um, certainly any fast action, forget about it. It's just not made for that. And um, indoor, it's just not that camera. So you do wanna supplement this with something else or really start to lean on this flash and then maybe pack some extra batteries. But I, I really am attached to this camera. Ergonomically, it's very sort of brickish. It's got some hard lines, but there is this texture here and a texture on the back. I thought I wouldn't enjoy the handling of this camera. And while it is not amazing, I don't, I do wish there was just a little bit of something to make it easier to handhold, but I, I really haven't minded it as much as I thought I would. It is ridiculously slow, but if you know that going in, you're gonna get amazing results from this. Again, you have to be patient. You have to be willing to put in the work. It's honestly a very frustrating camera in a lot of ways, but if you know what you're using it for, oh my gosh, it is just magic. It's pure magic what this camera can produce. I'm really happy with what I've captured with it. I absolutely will be keeping it in my collection. There's no chance of me selling this. So one comment I anticipate getting uh, is a question around the various generations of sensors. So there's this original generation of sensor, there's the Merrill Foveon sensor, and there's the Quattro Foveon sensor in sequence. So this versus the Merrill, there's definitely a difference. It's really interesting because each generation of the Foveon sensor is quite unique to its own line. Um, the original, I would say, is the most limited. The Merrill is also quite limited in terms of its dynamic range and all of that. But again, if you're working in Sigma Photo Pro, you can get around quite a bit of that. It recovers much more so than Lightroom would. And for the Merrill, you have to go into Sigma Photo Pro if you're working in the raw files because they will not be read by Lightroom. However, the Quattro is without question the most flexible generation of all. It has features even within Sigma Photo Pro that are not available for the Merrill or the generation before the original. So if you want max flexibility with the most recent renderings, I would say go for a Quattro. The Merrill is a bit sharper and has a very, very interesting, unique uh, feeling to the images. They are not comparable to the Quattro. They're just totally their own thing. And that's why I have both generations. And then this first generation is just kind of like a really great starter. They're all highly, highly unique. Um, but max flexibility would be your Quattro. Entry level would be this. And the Merrill is kind of in this unique standalone world of really sharp micro contrast, um, incredible resolution. It really stands on its own. So that is my beloved Sigma DP1S. As far as what I'll be shooting next, I have very generously been loaned a Summicron 40 millimeter Leica lens from the Leica Minolta partnership when they built the Leica CL, a film camera that I have owned twice. I love, I've owned that lens twice. I love it. I think it's fantastic. I don't exactly know why I sold any of it like at any point, but this is my life. I'm buying and selling cameras all the time. Um, and Ulysses Grant Parm here on YouTube very kindly reached out to me and said, hey, do you wanna try this lens out? I was like, of course, I love that lens. I know that lens and I have the perfect camera to shoot it on. The Leica SL is not a camera I've shot very much in the past. I recently acquired it in a trade 
and I'm really curious to see what it can do. It is a much more modern camera than I'm used to. It's also a CMOS camera, which post-processing wise makes me really uncomfortable. And, um, but there is another reason I'm doing this. I have been talking to Cobalt Image, which is a sort of software developer who has a number of different camera profiles and profile packs for color processing. And I reached out to them because I discovered they have what they call the CCD Fever Pack, which is supposed to take your CMOS images and render them in the likeness of a CCD camera, specifically the Fuji S5 Pro, the Leica M8, the Leica M9, Leica M9 Monochrome, and the Nikon D200. I could not not try that out. So I will be working with those presets on the Leica SL and let you know what I think. I'm honestly very curious, frankly, very skeptical, <laughs> but I would love to be proven wrong. I don't feel like you can really capture the CCD vibes with the CMOS sensor, but I could be completely ignorant in this regard and am looking forward to trying that out. So follow me on Instagram at one month, two cameras to see shots from the Leica SL with the CCD fever pack and join us on discord, digi discord, uh, link below as well as our Flickr, Flickr group, one month, two cameras, where we're posting shots from all our amazing old CMOS sensors, CCD sensors, anything sensors, film even. Um, it's really about the community sharing their work, talking about the things they love and making all these old cameras come back to life.